The Bible is the best seller that nobody reads. It's in the hotel rooms, it's all over. A few people like me, when I was a preacher, I would cherry pick verses to preach from and I thought I was teaching the Bible to my congregation. I was not, I was preaching the Bible. I thought I was teaching them things that were actually true from the Bible. I think no one in this country at least has done more to increase actual biblical literacy about what we should know about what the Bible not only says, but how it came to say what the authors thought it says. No one has done a better job of that than Bart Ehrman. And how many of you have read at least one book by Bart Ehrman? Look at that. Well, there's more in the back. Uh, there's a brand new book of his. Bart Ehrman is right here in North Carolina. He teaches the, at the University of North Carolina in, uh, in Chapel Hill. Woo woo, some Chapel Hill people here. He's, um, it's the um, James A. Gray professor in the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, he's a graduate of Wheaton College, of all things. And you know about Wheaton College, where they have the Billy Graham archives. Uh, Wheaton College, the bastion of critical biblical scholarship. Uh, <laughs> and maybe Bart will tell us a little bit about how his views change from being evangelical, true Bible believer, to actually a true Bible teacher. So uh, in light of the fact that he has had such a tremendous impact in his books, uh, my favorites are Misquoting Jesus and Forged. I, you know, I thought I knew a lot about the Bible as an ordained minister. I realized how little I actually knew about the Bible. Uh, and then his newest book, How Jesus Became God. We have copies of those books in the back. We only have a few left. We only have, I think, maybe 30 back there. So afterwards, uh, uh, Dr. Ehrman will sign some of the books for you. Uh, but in light of the fact of the tremendous contributions he's made towards real education, real Bible literacy, and just real religious literacy in this country, uh, as, a, as a public figure who speaks plainly about religion, we at the Freedom From Religion Foundation are offering Bart Ehrman the Emperor Has No Clothes Award. Today, without an actual emperor, the emperor has no clothes. I told you earlier that this statuette is made by the same company that makes the Oscars and it's based on that Hans Christian Andersen story about the young boy who's just told it like it was. The emperor had no clothes. So Bart Ehrman, come up here to receive. Well, uh, I'm really glad to be with you. Uh, this is an unusual experience for me. I, I usually don't get asked to speak to groups of uh, atheists, agnostics, and skeptics. I get asked to speak a lot of Christians. <laughs> so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is very nice. I'm sure uh, I'll enjoy this very much. I've had a lot of interesting speaking engagements this last, uh, this last year. Uh, about a month ago, I was asked to give a to do a public debate uh, at Northern uh, Alabama University. So uh, I had never been in Northern Alabama before. Uh, I came back and told my wife Sarah, "We don't live in the in the Bible Belt." <laughs> If you want to go to the Bible Belt, go to North Alabama. So I was, we, were, we were supposed to have this debate. Uh, the, the debate was, uh, the topic was whether the problem of suffering should call into question the existence of God. Uh, and I was debating a fellow who was a uh, Christian apologist, a, uh, a fundamentalist Christian apologist. Every time I have one of these debates, in the middle of the debate, I start writing notes to myself, with saying such things as, why the hell am I here? <laughs> uh, so uh, he was very articulate, uh, and, uh, and he knew a lot, and uh, he knew exactly what I was going to say, because I'd done this debate before, and he knew what my line was. Uh, I had no clue who he was. Uh, my, my, uh, my argument in this is that, in fact, uh, Believe, uh, the, the problem of suffering does cause problems for people who believe in God and should cause problems for, should call into question the existence of God. 
Uh, his argument was that I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started out, uh, th this, was, this was in front of a crowd of 1,200 people. And uh, I start, so, so the big church in Northern Alabama is the Church of Christ. I don't know if you know the Church of Christ, but it's a, uh, it's a big church in some parts of the, uh, the South, especially in Alabama, I think parts of Texas. And some of the churches of Christ are, are quite fundamentalist in their orientation. So I started out, uh, my presentation when I got up, is this big auditorium with 1,200 people in it. I, I asked, I said, so how many of you in here are associated with the Church of Christ? Boom! The entire room raises its <laughs> Oh my God, I'm in the lion's den. <laughs> so... My sense is that, uh, well, let me say, I, they were generous people, they were, they were kind to me, they were nice, they actually applauded, they laughed at a few of my jokes, I mean, it was fine. Uh, uh, my sense is that for people like that audience, um, the constitutional guarantee of freedom of religion is the freedom to practice their own religion but also for a lot of them, it's the freedom to impose their views of religion on the rest of us. My view is that freedom from religion does not mean necessarily opposing religion. I'm going to be, that's going to be one of the theses I have in my talk with you here. Freedom from religion means opposing the imposition of someone else's religion on us in our public institutions, our public spaces, our public schools, our public offices, and our public laws. I stress the difference between opposing religion and imposing the imposition of religion because for me, as an agnostic professor of religion, it's a very important distinction indeed. I am, in fact, not opposed to most kinds of religion. I'm simply opposed to the idea that someone else's religion should have any bearing on how I live my life in public or in private. It's very interesting being an agnostic scholar of religion. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to explore what it means for me to be one. I think I'll begin by explaining what I mean by, uh, what I myself mean by this term that I'm using, that we all use all the time, the term agnostic. Because over the last 18 months or so, I've come to think it means something different from what I used to think. So, what I used to think before I was an agnostic was that agnostics and atheists were two degrees of the same thing. Uh, and when I first declared myself agnostic, I was amazed at how militant both agnostics and atheists can be about their terms. <laughs> Every agnostic I met thought that atheists were simply arrogant agnostics. <laughs> and every atheist thought that every agnostic was simply a wimpy atheist. <laughs> Two degrees of the same thing. Well, someone will just say, I don't know. The other will admit they do know. And so that was the, I have come to think that, in fact, they are not two degrees of the same thing. They're two different kinds of thing. That agnosticism has to do with epistemology. What you know. What you know. And atheism has to do with belief. What you believe. I actually consider myself to be both an agnostic and an atheist. I'm an agnostic because if somebody says to me, is there a greater power in the universe? My response is, how the hell would I know? <laughs> I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. If somebody were to ask me, do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you believe in a God who interacts with the world, who intervenes in the world, who answers prayer? Do you believe in a supernatural divine being? No, I don't believe it. So I don't believe it, so I'm an atheist. But I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. Um, and since I'm a scholar, I prefer to emphasize 
knowledge rather than belief. And so I tend to identify as an agnostic. It's really unusual for anyone in my line of work to be an agnostic. Uh, I'm a professor of biblical studies. So there's a society of professors of biblical studies called the Society of Biblical Literature. We have our annual meeting every uh, November. Uh, there are probably 6,000 professors of religion in the Society of Biblical Literature. I don't have the exact number. I, I bet there are 6,000 of us who teach biblical studies at one level or another throughout the country. Uh, in seminaries, divinity schools, universities, colleges, and so forth and so on. Probably 6,000 of us. And they're, uh, well, <laughs> those of us who are agnostic or atheist are very much in the minority. Uh, Virtually everybody who teaches New Testament is, uh, is a Christian, as I was when I, started, uh, when I started being interested in biblical studies. Dan mentioned that I went to Wheaton College, the uh, alma mater of Billy Graham. Uh, I don't know if he knows this, but, uh, but in fact, for me, that was a step towards liberalism. <laughs> uh, I, I started out at Moody Bible Institute. Whereas we used to say, Bible is our middle name. <laughs> um, so uh, I, w I was a hardcore fundamentalist. I wasn't like those wimpy fundamentalists at, at Wheaton College. Um, but in any event, uh, we, those of us uh, who are atheists or agnostics in the Society of Biblical Literature are very much uh, in, in the minority. The others that I know about who are agnostic or atheists uh, do not... Uh, try to reach a wide audience. That's not unusual. Most people in the Society of Biblical Literature don't try to reach a wide audience. They write books for scholars, and they write, they write books maybe for churches or things, but, but very few people actually try to reach, reach a wide audience. I do try to reach a wide audience, and so uh, I want to talk for a minute about what it's like to be an agnostic New Testament scholar who tries to reach a wide audience. So there are actually three kinds of books that I write. I write, uh, I write textbooks for uh, college and university students. So I have a textbook on the New Testament uh, that, is, uh, that is widely used uh, throughout the country. In fact, I have two textbooks on the New Testament. And I have a textbook on the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, I've, got, I've got a number of textbooks that I write for, uh, for the 19-year-olds in college and, uh, and university. I write trade books, as they're called, for, for general audiences. So uh, this is the kind of book you would buy in a Barnes & Noble, uh, such as these three books that are, are back here. The, my most recent one is the one I'm going to spend most of my time talking about here, How Jesus Became God. It's written um, not for the 19-year-olds, but for their, you know, for their parents, uh, basically. Um, so uh, those are the two kinds of book. And so the one is for university students. The other is for a general audience. And obviously, I try to reach as broad of an audience as I, as I can. Um, the third kind of book I write are scholarly monographs. Uh, those are meant to be hard-hitting scholarly books for the six people in the world who care. <laughs> um, uh, and I, so I try to alternate which books I write. Two, two of those three, though, are intended to reach wide audiences, either university kids or, or adults. I do not see it as my mission in life to convert my readers to agnosticism or to atheism. My goals in writing my books are to educate the general population in knowledge about the New Testament and early Christianity, knowledge that's long been available to scholars, but that most people, as it turns out, uh, have no idea about even people who consider themselves Christian, who have allegedly been going to Sunday school their entire lives. They simply don't know what scholars are saying about the Bible. Most Christian scholars, this may come as a surprise to some of you, most Christian scholars are not actually believers in the infallibility of the Bible. Apart from fundamentalists and conservative evangelicals, most Bible scholars approach the Bible from a historical perspective, even if they do also consider it to be a document of faith. So most Bible scholars are not uh, closed-minded uh, fundamentalists uh, at all. When 
my colleagues uh, and all my friends, all my friends in the, virtually all my friends in the field are, uh, are believing Christians. When they approach the Bible in their research, they do it from a critical perspective. This involves historical knowledge. What we can know about the historical Jesus, the early Christian movement, and the New Testament from a historical perspective, as opposed to a believing theological, religious, or confessional perspective. This is what scholars of the Bible do, and unless they're fundamentalists, they do it historically. I'm interested myself in reaching the widest possible audience with this kind of information, the historical information, uh, whether people are non-believers or people of faith. I'm interested in reaching everyone. I don't see people of faith as my enemies or as my opponents. And I don't consider my textbooks or my trade books to be written against people of faith or positions of faith. With one exception, I do stand in opposition to anyone who is a fundamentalist, whether Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or even atheist. <laughs> My students sometimes ask, what is a fundamentalist? I give them a very simple definition. A fundamentalist is no fun, too much damn, and not enough mental. I would like to convert fundamentalists, so I, I mean, I am, I am out to convert fundamentalists, to deconvert fundamentalists. But other than that, my goal is to educate, not to convert. I want to talk about how I go about doing that as an agnostic historian of early Christianity by discussing my most recent book, How Jesus Became God. And so the bulk of what I want to say over the next 20 minutes or so uh, will be on this book that just, just came out. Uh, just, uh, just uh, you know, I don't know, a few weeks ago. So, the book is called How Jesus Became God, and in my opinion, it is dealing with the biggest issue I've ever dealt with in any of my books. Uh, I try to deal with big issues when I write books because uh, most people don't care about small issues, and so I'm interested in big issues, and I think this is the biggest thing I've ever tackled. It's obviously big for Christians because if Jesus had not been declared God, they wouldn't have a religion. <laughs> so for Christians, it really matters how Jesus became God, but I would argue that this question of how Jesus became God should be important for all of us, whether people of faith or not. And here's the reason. If Jesus had not been declared to be God, his followers would have remained a sect within Judaism. They would have remained a Jewish sect. They would not have attracted large numbers of Gentiles into the fold. If they hadn't drawn large numbers of Gentiles into the fold, the Christian religion would not have grown over the years at the rate that it did. If it had not grown at the rate it did, it would not have been a sizable minority at the beginning of the fourth century. Uh, at the beginning of the fourth century, the Christian religion made up maybe 5% of the Roman Empire, so something like 3 million people. If that hadn't happened, the Roman Emperor Constantine almost certainly would not have converted to Christianity. If Constantine had not converted, the Roman state would not have converted. If the Roman state had not converted to Christianity, we wouldn't have had the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, or modernity as we know it. It's a rather big question, because <laughs> if Jesus hadn't been declared God, none of that would have happened. So, uh, so this is not just a question for people who are personally committed to the idea that Jesus is God. It's important for all of us, I think, at least all of us who have any interest at all in the history of Western civilization. So uh, I, I think it's big. And so in this book, I want to tackle the question of how it came about. How did it come about that Jesus came to be declared God? So the way I start the book is somewhat discomforting for, uh, for conservative Christians. I start the book by talking about what we know about divine men in the ancient world. Jesus was not the only one who was a human being that some people thought was God or became God. And so in my, in my book, I show that in Greek and Roman circles, it was, it was thought that there were human beings who were also divine beings. Uh, 
So uh, it, it worked in one of three ways. Sometimes there was a human being who was just so far superior to the rest of us. Either they were uh, more powerful, or they were more intelligent, or they were more beautiful, or all three, that they, they, they were so special that at the end of their lives, the gods took them up and rewarded them uh, by making them gods themselves. So that happened, for example, with the founder of the, uh, the city of Rome, Romulus. Uh, Romulus, the founder of the city of Rome, was thought at the end of his life to have been taken up into the heavenly realm without dying and to been made a god. He, was, he became a powerful god. In, in ancient Rome, he was one of the three main gods worshipped in the city of Rome after he had been divinized. And of course, the Roman emperor was later thought to have been made a god. And so we, you have these, these humans who are made divine. The second way a human could be divine was that in some instances, a divine being would come down and would impregnate a mortal. A, a God would so my favorite story about this is, uh, is, is in a book called Amphictryon by the Roman comic playwright Plautus. Uh, I, you probably, most of you haven't read Plautus. I never read Plautus. I, I had decided early on in my academic career not to read Plautus because my brother wrote his PhD dissertation on Plautus. And I thought that if my brother liked him, he can't be that good. <laughs> so, so uh, but it turns out I was completely wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrific stuff. So according to Plautus, in this book, Amphictryon, he retells the story. Amphictryon is the name of a general of the, uh, of, the, of the city of Thebes. And Amphictryon has this gorgeous wife named Alcmena, whom uh, he has uh, left pregnant to go off to war. So he's off at war, and uh, Alcmena's at home. Jupiter, the king of the gods, looks down, and he sees Alcmena, and he is awed by her beauty. She is drop-dead gorgeous and Jupiter decides he has to have her. And so he knows how he's gonna make this happen. Jupiter comes down disguised as Amphictryon, and he tells Alcmena that he's come home from the war. She welcomes him with open arms, takes him to bed. Jupiter enjoys it so much that in the middle of the night, he orders the constellations to stop moving. In other words, he stops time. And they go at it, not just all night, but like forever, <laughs> until even Jupiter gets his fill, and uh, he orders the constellations to start up again. They start up again, and then he, uh, and he, you know, they get up in the morning. He, he ascends to heaven, and, uh, and then, as it turns out, the real Amphictyon comes home that morning <laughs> and doesn't understand why his wife doesn't welcome him with open arms. <laughs> She's had enough of him for the present, thank you very much. <laughs> and so, but as it turns out, as I said, Amphitryon had, she had been made pregnant by Amphitryon before he went off to war, but according to this myth, uh, Jupiter also made her pregnant. Uh, so they, they weren't real big on anatomy back in the days of Roman mythology, but anyway, she got doubly pregnant. And she had, she had twins. One of them you've heard of. Hercules was the son of Jupiter and Alcmena. That's how Hercules was born. But Hercules had a twin brother, Iphicles, who was, who was mortal. Hercules was born to the union of a god and a mortal, and so he was both god and human. So that's another way a person could be both divine and human at the same time if they have a parent, two different parents. The third way a, in Greek and Roman thinking that a person could be both divine and human was, was what happened when Jupiter came down as Amphitryon. Sometimes a god would become a mortal uh, temporarily. So be a human, but would, would be a god. All right, so in my book, I start out by explaining that there were these three ways that you could have both a human and a divine in, the ancient, in ancient thinking. Uh, and then I argue that Jews had the same way of thinking. That in fact, you know, many people today think that Jews were monotheists and so they, they couldn't imagine that a human could be divine. Wrong. 
In fact, Jews uh, at the time of Jesus had very much the same way of thinking. They knew of people who had been taken up and become God. For example, uh, Enoch. Uh, Enoch was thought to be a, uh, a, a human being who had been taken up to God and became a divine being himself. Um, there, were, there were traditions about uh, gods coming down and, uh, or divine beings coming down and having sex with mortals, producing uh, demigod offspring. You get that in the Bible, by the way. Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God looked down on the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful. And they came down and took wives for themselves. And their offspring were the Nephilim, the giants. Genesis chapter 6. That's why God flooded the world is because you had these demigods running around. These giants who were the offspring of divine beings and human beings. In Judaism. And in Judaism it was thought that humans could be gods. That uh, the, the king of Israel in the, in the Hebrew Bible is sometimes called Elohim, God. So, uh, so Jews had the same thing. So you have, in the ancient world, they had a different understanding of the divine realm from the way believers have today. Most believers today think that God is up there and God is, uh, is separated from us from this huge chasm. So you've got God, you've got chasm, you've got us. Ancient people didn't see it that way. The divine realm had no, a number of layers to it and the human realm had numbers of layers to it and sometimes they intersected. All right, so... That's the setup for explaining how it is that Jesus came to be thought of as God. One of the leading questions in my book is, did Jesus think that he himself was God? I devote a chapter to that, and I answer emphatically, no. Jesus did not think about himself as God. He did not call himself, at God, himself God. Jesus would have gone crazy if somebody told him they thought he was God, in my opinion. Uh, and I explain why, on historical grounds, that certainly is the case that Jesus didn't consider himself God. It is true that in one of our Gospels of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, Jesus identifies himself as God. Uh, Jesus in the Gospel of John, talking about the ancestor of all the Jews, Abraham, who lived 1,800 years earlier, Jesus says to his Jewish opponents, before Abraham was, I am. He lived 1,800 years earlier? Not only that, but the, word, the phrase, I am, is the name of God in the Old Testament. When Moses asked God, what is your name? God tells him, my name is I am. Jesus claims, I am, and his Jewish opponents know exactly what he's saying. They take up stones to stone him to death. A, a couple chapters later, Jesus, again to his Jewish opponents, says, I and the Father are one. Again, they break out the stones. Um, a few chapters later, Jesus tells his followers, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus makes these claims for himself in the Gospel of John. There's no doubt about that. The question is, did the historical Jesus make those claims about himself? What I argue in the book is that Jesus almost certainly did not. I give, I give a number of arguments for it, but I'll just tell you one of them, which is, John is our last Gospel to be written. It's probably written, I don't know, 60, 65 years after the death of Jesus. We have earlier Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And to some extent, we can reconstruct the sources behind Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you look at all the sources behind Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus never says these things about himself. Now, if Jesus, historically, were going around calling himself God, would would somebody who wanted to write an account of his life leave that part out? Like, that part wouldn't be important enough to mention? It's not in any of the earlier Gospels or sources, but it is in our latest. Why? Because it's not something that was historical. It was a later theological development put on the lips of Jesus. So, anyway, I devote a chapter to showing that Jesus didn't call himself God. Why, then, did his followers start calling himself God? This is the, the key to the book, uh, and it's the key to this whole question of how Jesus became God. 
Jesus' followers did not think he was God during his life. They certainly did not think he was God when he got crucified. But some of them came to think that he got raised from the dead. And that's what led them to call him God. So the question is, what happened to make people think that Jesus was raised from the dead? Christian apologists today will argue uh, that there are all sorts of reasons for thinking Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, when I was a Christian apologist, I used to get up on stage like this and argue and prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. And here's the proof. One of the proofs that's commonly said is that Jesus' tomb was found empty on the third day. That Jesus' tomb was found empty on the third day. And then what you do if you're an apologist, you say, well, why was the tomb empty? Everybody agrees it was empty, so why was it empty? Did somebody steal the body? Well, that's unlikely because of this reason, that reason, that reason. Did they go to the wrong tomb? Uh, well, that's unlikely because of this reason, this reason, that reason. Did they, I mean, you come up with the possible, you know, the possible explanations. And you, you rule them out, and then you say, since none of these explanations works, uh, Jesus must have actually left the tomb uh, alive. So in my book, I argue that, in fact, there was not an empty tomb, uh, that Jesus probably was not given a decent burial. Uh, my reason for thinking that and for arguing that is that we know something about Roman practices of crucifixion, and the normal Roman practice of crucifixion was to leave bodies on the cross for several days so the body would decompose and be eaten by scavengers. That was part of the punishment. It wasn't simply the horrific and slow, uh, tortuous death of crucifixion that was the punishment. It was also the fact you weren't going to be given a decent burial. Everybody in the ancient world wanted a decent burial, but crucified victims were not given a decent burial as part of the punishment, and the ravages wreaked on their body were also part of the punishment. They were left on the cross for days. And so the only question is, was there an exception in the case of Jesus? And I argue that uh, there probably was not an exception to the case of Jesus. Probably his body was left on the cross and then was eventually thrown into a common grave. That's, so it, was, it wasn't the discovery of an empty tomb that led anybody to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I argue in the book what led people to think Jesus was raised from the dead is that some of his followers had visions of him afterwards. Some of his followers had visions of him afterwards. This is an explanation that works for people of faith as well as for agnostics and atheists. People of faith would say the reason the disciples had visions of Jesus is because he was raised from the dead and he appeared to them. People who don't believe in the resurrection would say the reason people believed in the resurrection, they, the visions they had, were hallucinations. And so I spend a chapter in my book talking about what we know about hallucinations. It's interesting, there are two... Two, two of the most common forms of hallucination, oh, by the way, one out of eight of us have, has hallucinations. One out of eight of us has had or will have a, a vivid hallucination that we really believe. And there are two most common types. One common type is a deceased loved one. You know, you see your grandmother in your bedroom two weeks after she died. Happens a lot. Uh, and it's not only seeing you can hear them, you can talk with them sometimes, you can touch them, you, you physically experience this person's presence. It happens a lot. The other most common vision is revered loved ones. Uh, I'm sorry, not revered loved ones. Revered religious figures. Revered religious figures. Um, I have had Christian apologists tell me that there's no such thing as a mass hallucination. So... The hallucinations of Jesus don't work because lots of people saw him at the same time, and so that doesn't work because you can't have a mass hallucination. Precisely these Christian apologists who are all Protestants who want to argue that you can't have a mass hallucination, precisely these people are the people who deny that the Blessed Virgin Mary has shown up to hundreds and thousands of people at once, even though it's completely well documented by eyewitnesses. Why do they deny it? Because they don't believe it happened. But if they don't believe it happened, they believe in mass hallucinations because it's very well documented. So, uh, you know, you either believe in mass hallucinations or you don't, but you can't, you can't have it both ways. Well, anyway, so um, 
It is interesting that the two most common hallucinations are of deceased loved ones and revered religious figures because Jesus was both. And so it's not surprising that his followers had hallucinations of him, uh, as I assume that they were. So once the Christians came to, once the followers of Jesus came to think that he was no longer dead, uh, they thought, well, they knew, they knew that he wasn't still here. In other words, they, they didn't think that Jesus had a near-death experience. It wasn't that he, his body was reanimated, because his body wasn't here. He didn't return to Galilee to start, you know, getting into controversies with the Pharisees again. Or, you know, he didn't go back to Capernaum to do this, that, or that. He didn't, he, he's not here. Well, if we know he got raised from the dead, because we saw him, and he's not here, where is he? He must have been taken up to heaven. And so their immediate thought was that Christ, had, Jesus, had been taken up to heaven. And what does an ancient person think if they think that someone's been taken up to heaven? They think he's been made a divine being. That started the idea that Jesus is God as soon as they thought that Jesus had been raised. In the New Testament itself, there are different authors who have different understandings of what it means to call Jesus God. Remember I said there are three ways in the ancient world that it could happen, and all three ways are applied by different Christians to Jesus. There are Christians in the New Testament who think that when Jesus was raised, he was made God, so he's exalted to the divine realm. I think that's the view of the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel. Mark, though, doesn't think it happened at the resurrection. The earliest Christians thought it happened at the resurrection, but as Christians thought more about this, they thought, well, actually, it must not have just been at the resurrection he was made God. He must have been the Son of God during his entire ministry. And so the first thing that happens in Jesus' ministry in the Gospels is he gets baptized. Mark's Gospel begins with Jesus getting baptized, and when he gets baptized in Mark's Gospel, a voice comes from heaven and says, You are my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is made the Son of God at his baptism. As Christians thought about it more, they thought, Well, it wasn't just during his ministry that he was the Son of God. He must have been the Son of God from his entire life. And so there developed traditions in Christianity like this idea of a God coming down and having sex with a mortal, there developed the idea that God got Jesus' mother pregnant. That's where you get the virgin birth traditions, which are not in Mark, but they are in Luke. In Luke's gospel, the reason Jesus is the Son of God is because the Holy Spirit makes Mary pregnant, even though she's a virgin. So Jesus is literally the Son of God. As Christians thought about it more, they started thinking, well, he wasn't just the Son of God during his entire life. He must have always been the Son of God. There developed the idea then that Jesus actually had existed before he was born, that he was a pre-existent divine being who became human temporarily, like the, the third way of becoming a divine human in the ancient world. And that's what you get in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is a pre-existent divine being who comes into the world as a human and then leaves it afterwards to return up to heaven. So, uh, the ideas about Christ developed already within the New Testament. By the time you get into the second century, virtually all Christians are saying that Jesus is God. That led to some problems for Christians. The most obvious problem was, if Jesus is God and God is God, don't we have two gods? And if you throw the Holy Spirit into the mix, don't we have three gods? So aren't we really polytheists? Christians wanted to say, no, we're not polytheists, we're monotheists. Yeah, but you just said that God's God and Jesus is God and the Spirit is God. So you're not a monotheist. No, we are monotheists. Well, how's that work exactly? So th there were debates in the second, so the, the end of my book, I deal with these debates in the second, third, fourth centuries about this kind of thing. There were some, there were some clever solutions to this problem. There, were, there was one group of uh, thinkers that was the dominant view uh, at the end of the second Christian century that said, it, it was, it's a view that this, modern scholars have called it modalism. It's modalism because it insists that God exists in three modes. So I myself, as a human being, I personally am a son 
and I'm a brother, and I'm a father all at the same time. But there's only one of me. And so God is like that. He's got three modes of existence. He's both Father, Son, He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there's only one of Him. So that was a view that was dominant for a long time, but it ended up being declared a heresy uh, because it didn't emphasize the distinctiveness of the three enough. Because um, people started saying, well, look, I mean, it can't really be that way because when Jesus prays in the New Testament, he's not just talking to himself. And so (laughs) there's something else. So they ended up with the idea that, in fact, there are three distinct beings, all three of whom are fully God. They're distinct from one another. They're all fully God. They are all equally God. But there's only one God. That's the doctrine of the Trinity that there's one God manifest in three persons. And it doesn't make sense rationally, and it's not meant to make sense rationally. If anybody who says they understand the doctrine of the Trinity misunderstands it, because <laughs> you can't understand it. So, uh, so I end my book by talking about the controversies that ended up with how Christ came to be thought, not merely as a divine being who became a divine being, but came to be thought of as equal with God the Father and someone who had always existed from eternity past. Uh, I talk about the developments that led to that. What in this book would be offensive to fundamentalists? Apart from most of it. (laughs) Uh, Two things would be especially offensive to conservative Christians. One is my claim that Jesus did not call himself God. and that Jesus did not understand himself as God. The historical Jesus did not understand himself to be God. That would be offensive to conservative Christians. Um, The second thing that would be offensive and has been offensive is my claim that Jesus did not get a decent burial, that he was not buried by Joseph of Arimathea, and that his his tomb was not discovered on the third day. Those two are the outstanding claims that especially would be and have been offensive to people. What should be offensive to other Christians, say to liberal Christians, mainline denominational Christians. My view is that nothing in the book should be offensive to other people of faith who are not fundamentalists or conservative evangelicals. I had four friends of mine read the book, four scholars who all self-identify as Christian, and none of them had problems with any of it because you know, there, there are smart Christians in the world and who are critical scholars, and uh, just because they're people of faith doesn't make them fundamentalists. Well, why don't I go after all the Christians, though? Why not just really stick it to them? (laughs) Here I get back to what I, and I'll close with the next few uh, comments. Um, I get back to what I started off saying. My goal as an agnostic scholar of religion is not to attack religion. My goal is to educate people about the history of early Christianity and to help people be more thoughtful about whatever it is they believe or don't believe, whether they happen to be Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or pagan or agnostic or atheist. My goal is to try and help people think more about what it is they believe or don't believe. Some people have accused me of mocking others who differ from my perspectives. But in fact, the only groups that I mock are fundamentalists, because they deserve it, and authors who pretend to know what they're talking about when, in fact, they're clueless. Uh, There are plenty of authors like that among both Christians and atheists. And I can tell you from personal experience, neither group likes to be mocked, (laughs) as they let me know. But I don't think that people of faith, as a rule, are idiots. Faith is not a matter of smarts. Uh, Next week, I am going to the beach, as I do every year, with my uh, best friend, Dale Martin, who uh, teaches New Testament at Yale University, the senior professor of New Testament at Yale, and my wife, Sarah Beckwith, who is a chaired professor of English at Duke University. Both of these people are flat out smarter than me, Uh, especially Sarah. (laughs) They are both smart, they, they, they are, they're both smarter than me. And both of them are Christians. And if you ask either one of them, is Jesus God, they would both say yes. 
But it's not a matter of smarts. And so I don't, I don't think that there's any point in pretending that Christians are all idiots, because they're not idiots. I don't believe in attacking people for their intelligent understandings of the world, even when they disagree with my understanding of the world, unless they're religiously fundamentalist or socially dangerous. Then I think they are worth attacking. In part, I don't believe in going for the jugular of every person of faith because I don't think that anyone has been converted to a new point of view that way. When I was in seminary and I was a conservative evangelical, my first semester I took a course with a fairly radical professor of New Testament who had extremely liberal views and he had no impact on me whatsoever because he was so different from me and so opposed to everything I thought that I put up barriers and didn't want to hear it and so I didn't hear it. The second semester I took a course on the New Testament with a very caring, loving, pious, uh, a scholar who was sensitive to my points of view and who listened to me and ha had some differences, but, but he was very gentle, and he started the process of my deconversion because I didn't put up the barriers. People are converted by love, not by hate. They're converted by an attractive alternative, not by vitriol. They're converted by patient and loving and intelligent explanation, not by harsh, browbeating rhetoric. Now, I, mean, I know many Christians would be surprised to hear me say this, <laughs> because as I pointed out, I do have a reputation for being aggressive and hard-hitting and controversial. But I don't see myself that way. I see myself as someone who's passionate for the truth who's willing to lay it out in clear and stark terms as necessary, even if that offends somebody's religious sensibilities, or I might add their mythicist sensibilities. <laughs> My goal, though, is not to offend. It's to educate people about the history of early Christianity and especially to get people to think. If anyone finds my views offensive, whether fundamentalist or mythicist, I firmly believe that's not because I'm an iconoclast, but because some people just don't want to consider dispassionately and even-handedly points of view other than their own. That lies at the heart of fundamentalists. I don't think that freedom from religion means browbeating everyone we know into submission to our agnostic or atheist views. It means ourselves being able to live in an environment where we're not forced to live according to religious standards and perspectives pushed on us by others. But if we don't want religion forced on us, then we should not cynically or hypocritically force our atheism on others. We should live and let live in mutual respect and thoughtful consideration, carefully explaining our points of view and showing why they are superior to the views of faith. That superiority has to be shown in how we cherish and live our lives. Being free from the imposition of religion does not mean being free from the good benefits that have helped society in the name of religion. If agnostics, atheists, and skeptics want to compete with the religions of the world, they need to become an equally significant player in dealing with the problems of the world. We need an agnostic, atheist, and skeptical presence in the world that can rival the institutions of the faith communities throughout the world. I know about the Church of Christ, the Westboro Baptist Church, the Vatican, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Mormons, and the Durham Rescue Mission. Why don't I know about the comparable institutions and social structures of atheists, agnostics, and skeptics? Why isn't the Freedom From Religion Foundation in the news as much as the Southern Baptist Convention? Non-theist organizations that are free from religion need to become as recognizable as the Baptist church on the corner and the Episcopal church up the street. They need to be seen as the first responder when the hurricanes and earthquakes and famines hit. 
They need to be seen as a, ma as a major force in the fight against poverty, homelessness, malaria, AIDS, or name your epidemic. They need to be seen as a vibrant and viable alternative to the religions of the world, which often do so much harm while trying to do good. Whatever else we might say about organized religion, it cannot be denied that religion is often the catalyst for much of what is good in the world. But it shouldn't be the only one, especially since so many people are silenced, oppressed, and harmed by religion. We want to be free from the imposition of religion, and we would like others to be free from the superstitions of religion. But once these people are freed from the bonds that bind them, they need to be liberated not only from something, but also for something. Humanists need to have something and some place to give people to replace what they lose when they leave their faith. That, in my opinion, should be the leading goal and objective of every humanist organization. And I hope the Freedom From Religion Foundation and all of us can help to make it possible. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? I do not see evidence in archaeology or history for its historical piece. Yeah, well, I do. I mean, uh, that's why I wrote the book. Well, I mean, okay, yeah, I mean, I have a whole book on it. <laughs> I mean, uh, so th there is a lot of evidence. I mean, there, there is so much evidence that it is, it is not, I mean, I know in the, in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside of your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. It is not an issue for scholars. There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. Now, that is not evidence. That is not evidence. Just because everybody thinks so doesn't make it evidence. But if you want to know about the theory of evolution versus the very theory of creationism, and every scholar in every reputable institution in the world thinks that believes in evolution, it may not be evidence, but if you've got a different opinion, you better have a pretty good piece of evidence yourself. There, the reason for thinking Jesus exists is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. That's why. And I give the details in my book. Uh, early and independent sources uh, indicate that Jesus, certainly that Jesus existed. One author that we know about knew Jesus' brother and knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. He's an eyewitness to both Jesus' closest disciple and his brother. So, I mean, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, again, I, res I respect your disbelief, but I, I, you know, if you want to go where the evidence goes, I think, that, I think that atheists have done themselves a, mis, a, a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mythicism because, frankly, it makes, it makes you look foolish to the outside world. It's, if that's what you're going to believe, you just look foolish. Uh, you, you are much better off going with historical evidence and arguing historically rather than coming up with the theory that Jesus didn't exist. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is about um, other, you talked about uh, the fundamentalist scholars, if you can call them that. Um, my, my question is, even though they, they might, like yourself, where you may have had sort of this wall in front of you uh, before you kind of peel back the layers, how is it possible for some of these folks to claim to be biblical scholars where they study ancient Greek or Hebrew uh, to, continu to continue on? like that for 20, 30, 40 years? Are they not um, introduced to some of the same evidence that you see? Uh, are you talking about fundamentalists or are you talking about just other biblical scholars? Well, fundamentalists primarily. Yeah, fundamentalists. Yeah, no, I'll tell you. I mean, the thing about fundamentalism is that it's a completely coherent system internally. It's an internally coherent system. So it, and it's a closed system. So if you've got a closed system that's internally coherent, it's very hard to, to make any inroads into it. Um, 
Uh, and so since it's internally coherent and since there is such a very strong social fabric keeping it together, uh, you just, you can't convince a fundamentalist that he or she's wrong. You just can't do it. You can point to any contradiction in the Bible and it just doesn't matter. They'll just say either they'll figure some way to reconcile it or they'll say, uh, well, I just believe that, you know, even though I don't understand, God does understand. You know, and so uh, there's just no, no inroads. I, I had a student this semester, uh, a lovely young woman who was just a flat out fundamentalist in my New Testament class that just ended last week. My, in my class, uh, I, I require every student in class to engage in a class debate in their small group recitation. So the class itself is 250 students, but every student is in a 20-person recitation. And everybody in that recitation has to be involved in a debate. And the debates are on controversial topics. Uh, the first debate is, resolve the Apostle Paul's views of women were oppressive. Uh, that debate, I used to call that debate, I used to, the resolution used to be, resolve the Apostle Paul was a misogynist. But I realized after a while that some of my students didn't know what misogynist meant. And that led to some very interesting debates. <laughs> um, the, the second debate is resolved. Uh, Paul and Jesus represented fundamentally different religions. The third debate is resolved. The New Testament condemns modern practices of homosexuality. So students have, some students have to argue affirmative, some have to argue negative on both of these. This woman was assigned to argue that the New Testament does not condemn modern practices of homosexuality. She refused to do it. She would flunk the class rather than argue against her faith. Jeez, you gotta be kidding me. I've taught 20,000 students. I've never had a student refused. I'm, I said, look, you're not arguing you think this. You just have to argue what other people think. No, nope, I refuse. I'm not gonna do it. Ah, jeez. So I, you know, I made her write a 20 page term paper <laughs> instead. Uh, <laughs> but at, after the course is over, she wrote me an email two days ago. Dr. Ehrman, I'm praying for you, and I just pray that you, you'll see that Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I wrote her back and I said, thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I hope that you will pursue the truth no matter where it takes you. You know, I'm just thinking maybe, you know, maybe in five years that'll, she writes back, no, you don't understand. I'm praying that you'll understand that Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever, yeah. Right. I, I just don't think there's any way in road, really. Yeah, yes. I have a question about the uh, theological developments you were talking about, especially considering the Jewish nature of the Jesus movement. Yeah. Uh, of course, in the Old Testament, there's very little examples of resurrection, and when it happens, it happens with a human agent. There's a lot of fertility problems, but no virgin birth. But around the time of Jesus, and in the same area, you've got a ton of pagan religions. Obviously, you just mentioned about some, several figures who were divine. You've got, you know, Addis and Mithra and Horus and people that have... Uh, they have virgin births and then you have uh, resurrections as well that don't require human agents. So what I'm wondering is when you have these elements of pagan theology kind of infused in Christianity, how do you account for that over the development or do you? Yeah, thank you. You know, it's, it is a modern myth that, um, that there were lots of accounts of people being born of virgins and on December 25th and that they were crucified and that they were buried and raised from the dead. It's actually a modern myth. Those, uh, Mithras was not born on December 25th. Uh, his mother was not a virgin. Uh, Osiris is not raised from the dead. Uh, People say that, but the people who say that don't know the ancient sources. The ancient sources, in fact, don't bear that out. Um, there are a number of things, though, that are common to uh, pagan religions. Uh, in my book, I talk about Apollonius of Tiana, who had, he didn't have a virgin birth, but he had a spectacular, miraculous birth. Uh, he was understood to be the son of God. He could, um, he could heal the sick. He could cast out demons. He could raise the dead. At the end of his life, he ascended to heaven. And so, I mean, it sounds a lot like Jesus. So what's that about? Well, what it's about is the Christians are speaking in terms that the people around them can understand. And their understanding of Jesus is, of course, borrowed from the environment. The only way we understand anything is in relationship to what we already know. And so what they knew were these stories, and so Jesus was told in light of the stories. That's absolutely right. So I, I, do, uh, I do talk about that at some length in, in my book. Looks like I have one time for one more question. Just uh, wanted to know if you're, you must be familiar with The Chris Corruption of Christianity by Joseph Priestley. And yes. wondered if you could make any comments. Uh, 
uh, yeah, you know, I don't have any comments to make because it's been so long since, since I've even thought about it. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, let me uh, thank you again for this, uh, for this award and for being here today. Thank you very much.